Thank you. Thank you very much. I just had a great conversation with the leading faith leaders of our country. It went extremely well. We learned a lot. I learned a lot. And uh, we're working on some things that are very interesting and very positive. I thank them all for being on the call. And yesterday, we unveiled detailed guidelines for America's governors to initiate a phase, safe, and gradual reopening of America. That's what's happening. The guidelines provide governors with the fact-driven and science-based metrics they will need to make the decisions that are right for their own particular state. To view the guidelines, you can go to the website at whitehouse.gov slash opening America. So that's whitehouse.gov slash opening America. Treasury has sent out economic relief payments to more than 80 million Americans who have their direct deposit information on file with the IRS. And an incredible uh, success it has been. If you have not received your check, please visit irs.gov, get my payment. How about that one? irs.gov, get my payment. That way, the IRS can get you your payment in days. And they've done a fantastic job, I have to say. And you won't have to wait for a check in the mail. I, I have some very good news. We sent out 80 million deposits, and less than 1 percent had even little problems. A couple had minor glitches, but it's substantially less than 1 percent. So out of 80 million deposits, uh, less than 1 percent, and that gets corrected immediately. So uh, just please do as I say. You'll get that very quickly very easily. Today, I'm also announcing that Secretary Perdue, who happens to be right next to me, handsome man, and the Department of Agriculture will be implementing a $19 billion relief program for our great farmers and ranchers as they cope with the fallout of the global pandemic. Very honored to be doing this. Our farmers, ranchers, we have uh, — these are great people, great Americans. Never complain. They never complain. They just do what they have to do. The program will include direct payments to farmers, as well as mass purchases of dairy, meat, and agricultural produce to get that food to the people in need. The USDA will receive another $14 billion in July that will have funding to continue help our — helping, and this will help our farmers and our ranches, and it's uh, money well-deserved. So not only were they targeted at one point by China, and that was over a period of time, and you saw that happening, and they never complained, but that worked out very well. $12 billion they got and $16 billion they got, and now it's $19 billion. And I'm just going to ask Secretary Perdue to explain exactly how we're going to handle it. Thank you. Well, Mr. President, you may remember earlier this year, you tweeted uh, a message to our farmers and ranchers that no matter the circumstances, you pledged to stand behind them. And while none of us could ever have anticipated this type of pandemic that we're currently in, I think today's announcement is proof that you put our — you have our farmers' backs and that you will continue to do what it takes to support them, and they are very grateful. We've heard a lot recently, all of you, about our food supply chain. I think America now knows that more than ever that the wholesome food that our families depend upon and starts with America's farmers and ranchers. America, agriculture has been hard hit like most of America with the coronavirus, and President Trump is standing with our farmers and all Americans to make sure we all get through this national emergency. So today, thanks to your direction and leadership, Mr. President, USDA is announcing the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. As you mentioned, this new $19 billion program will take several immediate actions to assist farmers, ranchers, and consumers in response to the COVID-19 national emergency. The program is really divided into two parts. One is a uh, direct payment, $16 billion in direct payments to farmers, ranchers, and producers who've experienced unprecedented losses during this pandemic. 
since we wanted to get the payments out to producers as quickly as possible, we decided to use the funds in the CCC, the current funds of six and a half million billion dollars, combined with the 19.5 of COVID money, rather than wait for the replenishment of the CCC funds in July. Based on industry estimates of damage, Mr. President, it is becoming apparent that we'll need the additional CCC funds as we continue to track the economic losses. Secondly, and this is really important as well, the USDA will be purchasing $3 billion in fresh produce, dairy, and meat products to be distributed to Americans in need through our food bank networks, as well as other community and faith-based organizations. Having to dump milk or plow under vegetables ready to market is not only financially distressing, but it's heartbreaking as well to those who produce them. This program will not only provide direct financial relief to our farmers and ranchers, Mr. President, but will allow for the purchase and distribution of our agricultural abundance in this country to help our fellow Americans in need. So in recent weeks, we've seen, all of us have seen the heroic patriotism of our food supply chain workers that have shown day in and day out doing the work to serve the needs of fellow Americans. Our farmers have been in the fields planning and doing what they do every spring to feed the American people, even with the pandemic as we speak. I want to thank you, Mr. President, for your unwavering support. They want to thank you for your unwavering support for America's farmers and ranchers. And I want to commit to you, Mr. President, and to the American people that USDA will do everything in our power to ex implement this program as quickly and as efficiently as possible to help our farmers, ranchers, producers, and consumers during this great time of need. So thank you very much for having me here today. And God bless you. God bless America. God bless American agriculture. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonny. So our great Secretary of Agriculture was the governor of Georgia for eight years, and the only reason he uh, isn't still there, frankly, is that he was term limited. And I said, let's get him for agriculture, and you've done a fantastic job. We want to thank you very much. Eight years at Georgia. We really appreciate it. Great job. Even as we prepare to rebuild our economy, America continues to wage an all-out medical war to defeat the invisible enemy. To date, we have conducted more than 3.78 million coronavirus tests, by far the most of any country. It's not even close. In the hardest-hit areas, such as New York and Louisiana, we've also tested more people per capita than South Korea, Singapore, and every other country. The United States has the most robust, advanced, and accurate testing system anywhere in the world. As of yesterday, we have distributed nearly 660,000 Abbott IDs. Now, that's a, uh, an incredible test. It's called the ID Now Point of Care Diagnostic Test, and it's fantastic. Uh, it's, a hot, it's the hot one. The problem with this business is it's the hot one till about two days from now because we do have a saliva test that just uh, came out, and that can be self-administered, and it's uh, said to be fantastic. I want to thank Abbott Laboratories. They have been incredible. I want to thank Roche. They've likewise been incredible. Over the last several days, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of tests conducted by hospitals and academic institutions, which have now performed nearly 600,000 tests there is a tremendous amount of unused capacity in the states available for governors to tap. We have tremendous unused capability within those laboratories, and I hope the governors are going to be able to use them. The governors are responsible for testing, and I hope they're going to be able to use this tremendous amount of available capacity that we have. It's up to one million additional tests per week. When you think of that, in the next few weeks, we'll be sending out 5.5 million testing swabs to the state. Swabs can be done easily by the governors themselves. Mostly it's cotton. It's not a big deal. You can get cotton easily. But if they can't get it, uh, we will take care of it. Uh, yesterday, the FDA announced a new collaboration with United Health Group, the Gates Foundation. Quantigen and U.S. cotton to greatly expand the supply of essential swabs, including a new polyester Q-tip type swab for the coronavirus testing. All of these actions will help our testing capability continue to grow dramatically. 
So we're helping people even with swabs. We get ventilators. We're now the, the king of ventilators. We have hundreds of thousands under construction. We don't need them ourselves. The governors are in great shape. If we do, we have a great stockpile that we'll immediately send to the state in need. But we've handled that situation incredibly well. I hope uh, people understand it. I wish the media would get the word out. What we've done in ventilators is amazing, because they're, they're big, expensive, and highly complex. Uh, we're speaking to other countries. I spoke to the President of Mexico today, a great gentleman. And I told him that uh, we are going to be helping him out with ventilators, help, helping Mexico out, and we'll be helping some other countries, too. We have uh, a lot of very high-level, high-quality ventilators. And they're here, and they're also being manufactured as we speak. Following the announcement of our reopening guidelines, there have been some very partisan voices in the media and politics who have spread false and misleading information about our testing capacity is totally false and misleading, demonstrating a complete failure to understand the enormous scope of the testing capabilities that we've brought online. And we started really from ground zero. We started from really being very, very uh, outdated and obsolete as a country from the past. And uh, I will say this, if they didn't understand it, it's just really Unfortunately, I hate to say this because we've been getting along very well, but it would be false reporting because they understand the capability. And it's going to be up to the states to use that capability. The states have local points where they can go, the governor can call the mayors, and the mayors can call representatives, and everybody, everything is perfect. And that's the way it should work and always should work. We'll help New York and all of the other states get even better on their testing. We have to get even better. And some people think a little bit differently. There are areas where you have vast amounts of uh, area where you have very few people, and almost no people are infected. And those places will be looked upon differently by different governors. And I think you're going to have a lot of news coming out about that over the next few days. I think certain states are going to um, come online, and uh, they're going to start the early stages of the puzzle that we're putting together. And it's going to be together sooner rather than later. A lot of really incredible things are happening. And uh, at some point in the not-too-distant future, we're going to have our country back. And uh, it's going to be, I think, really, with what we're doing on stimulus and helping people keep their businesses together and their lives together and their jobs, it's going to be better than ever before. I hope so. I really do. The current conversation is uh, reminiscent of what happened on ventilators. You remember that. When requests were made far beyond what was objectively needed, we were hearing from a certain state, and we were hearing from a lot, that they needed far more ventilators. In one case, they wanted 40,000 ventilators, 40,000. It turned out that they had plenty, and they had a number of about seven or 8,000, and that was plenty. We supplied them with a lot, but that was the right number. We, we got it just about right. And if they did need more, we're ready to give more. But I think the surge seems to be over. And there are a lot of governors just doing a great job, and they're working with us, but we're all working together. Uh, the research and development that we've done at the federal level has been absolutely incredible. The media will be accepting of these figures when they get to see the end result. I think they're going to see it, and I think they're already seeing it. That includes not only ventilators, but beds. We've built, in most cases, far more than they even needed. Uh, but we wanted to err on the side of caution. This is what the governors wanted. They wanted a certain amount in Louisiana. Uh, I spoke with the governor, had a long talk with him, and I said, do you think you'll need that final hospital? And they actually didn't need it. We built a lot of a lot of beds, so I appreciate it from the governor. Uh, and we saved building a hospital uh, in New York. We did, a, I think, just a spectacular job at the Javits Center. And uh, even sending the ship up became — we brought it into COVID, but they didn't uh, — they didn't really need it. It didn't get much use, but it was there and ready. It wasn't supposed to be used for that purpose. We changed it into that purpose. And uh, it was there, ready, willing, and able. Same with Javits. But they didn't quite need the rooms that we uh, — the uh, beds that we 
we produced. So we produced almost 2,900 beds. And uh, I think I'd rather tell you that we were overprepared than we were, than we were underprepared. And that was a good faith effort by New York, I have to say that. A very good faith effort, but it's nice that we didn't need that instead of needing it. It was not very occupied, but it was ready to go. Still there should something happen, but I think they have it under very good control. As you'll hear from our experts today, we've already built sufficient testing capacity nationwide for states to begin their reopenings. And I think you'll be hearing a lot about reopenings in the coming weeks and months. Uh, most excitingly, in the coming weeks, I think you're going to see some very, very dramatic steps taken, and very safely. We're putting safety first. Uh, we may be opening, but we're putting safety first. And when you look at the, uh, the numbers, when you look at the possible number of death, deaths at 2.2 million people, and it could have very well been that. It could have been more. Frankly, I've been looking at numbers where it could have been higher than that. 2.2 uh, million people dying. If you figure we lost 500,000, maybe 600,000 in the Civil War, 2.2 million people, a minimum, if we did nothing, would have been 1.6. If you cut that in half, you're talking about 800,000, 900,000, a million people dying. But we did a lot of work, and the people of this country were incredible, I have to say. And uh, I think we're heading to the other category, and that would be if we, if we did work and if it was successful. They had between 100,000 and 220,000 to 240,000 on the upside. And I think we'll be substantially, hopefully, below the 100 number. And I think right now we're heading at probably around 60, maybe 65,000. And one is too many. I always say it. One is too many. It's a horrible thing that happened to our country. There's a horrible thing that happened to 184 countries all over the world. There's a horrible thing, and there was no reason for it. It should never, ever happen again. In a few minutes, you'll be hearing from Dr. Redfield, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, and Admiral Guar to explain these facts in, in really great detail. Earlier this week, the FDA authorized two new antibody tests, which is very exciting, that will determine if someone has been previously infected with the virus, bringing the total to four authorized antibody tests already. This will help us assess the number of cases that have been asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and support our efforts to get Americans back to work by showing us who might have developed the wonderful, beautiful immunity. Ultimate victory in this war will be made possible by America's scientific brilliance. Uh, there is nothing like us. There is nobody like us, not even close. I wish I could tell you stories what other countries, even powerful countries, say to me, the leaders. And they say it quietly, and they say it off the record, but they have great respect for what we can do. And our country is uh, at a point a few weeks ago, think of it, four or five weeks ago, we were at a level that nobody had ever attained, the best job numbers we've ever had, the best economy we've ever had. Every company virtually was doing better business than ever before. The stock market was at all-time highs. And then one day, they said, you got to close it up. And we did the right thing. We saved maybe millions of lives by doing it the way we did it. But we're paying a price, but that price is very unimportant compared to the number of lives we're talking about. The NIH and others are conducting clinical trials of 35 different therapies and treatments, therapies being so exciting to me, because that's really like, if something happens, you're going to get better reasonably quickly and without such a horrible deal as some people have to go through. To that end, today, NIH announced that it is launching a public-private partnership with more than a dozen biopharmaceutical companies. They're HHS, FDA, CDC, and the European Medicines Agency. They're all working together. We're working together with a lot of other countries. The partnership will marshal and coordinate the vast resources, knowledge, assets, and authorities of more than a dozen organizations and agencies to accelerate development of the most promising therapies and vaccines. The vaccines are coming along really 
really well. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is very well advanced. The one thing is they have to uh, — we're having great, great uh, success, but we have to test them, and it takes a long period of time. It takes probably over a year, unfortunately. But therapies, likewise, are coming along very, very well. Therapies are immediate when we get that. That'll be a big day. We're also equipping our medical warriors on the front lines in total. We have the Project Air Bridge, and the Air Bridge has been incredible. The national strategic stockpile and every other channel the federal government has deployed. If you think about this, 44.5 million N95 masks, nearly 524 million gloves, 63.5 million surgical masks, and more than 10 million gowns. And we have 500 million masks coming in very soon between manufacturing and orders. 500 million masks. The last few months have been among the most challenging times in the history of our nation. This invisible enemy is tough, and it's smart, and it's vicious. But every day, we're getting closer to the future that we all have been waiting for. I talk about the light at the end of the tunnel. We are getting very, very close to seeing that light shine very brightly at the end of that tunnel. And it's happening, and I want to thank everybody in the room. I want to thank uh, I, I actually want to thank some of the media. We've had some fair coverage, some really fair coverage, and I appreciate it. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, our great Vice President, Mike Pence, and he's going to take over for a little while. I'm going to leave, and I'm coming right back, and we'll take some questions. They're going to go over uh, our tremendous testing capabilities. Uh, and again, I'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, and good afternoon, all.